Hi there, thanks for joining us. This is Astronomy Daily. I'm your host, Andrew Dunkley, and it's uh, great to have you with us once again for your daily dose of astronomy and space science news. And speaking of news, here's Hallie, our AI reporter, with the latest. What? No preamble today, Andrew. Well, normally I'd love a chin wag, but um, we've got the grandchildren here today. Um, they're getting really tired and, and kind of, you know, grisly and carrying on like pork chops. So I thought we'd just do this fast so that I can get back out there and, and keep them under control. Human children, I, I, I guess you don't really understand. Say no more. I get it. I have to tutor my sister's kids in Java language and their attention span only lasts microseconds and their RAM is off the charts sometimes. Uh, okay, now we really need to talk, but we haven't got time because they'll hear me. So let's get the news headlines. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley. China's Human Spaceflight Agency has begun the search for a new batch of astronauts. The China Man Space Agency announced that it will select 12 to 14 candidates to join its pool of astronauts for future spaceflight missions. Those selected will form China's fourth generation of astronauts. CMSA said that it will seek seven to eight pilots along with five or six spaceflight engineers. Up to two of the latter group will be payload specialists. The pilots will be selected from the People's Liberation Army. Civilians from China's space-related sectors can apply to be spaceflight engineers. The new astronaut selection round is open to candidates from Hong Kong and Macau for the first time. The Nobel Prize for Physics has been awarded to scientists working on a solution for quantum computing. French physicist Alain Aspect, Austria's Anton Zeilinger, and American John Clauser were honored for their experiments exploring the nature of entangled quantum particles. Defying the logic of our everyday reality, these particles behave like a single unit even when they are far away from each other. Engineers are currently working on harnessing this odd behavior in a range of revolutionary technologies. Quantum computing and quantum cryptography, a supposedly unbreakable technique of secure information coding. Russia's space agency is discussing with Moscow a continuation of its participation in the International Space Station past 2024. A Roscosmos official said this week. Sergei Krikalev, head of Russia's human spaceflight programs, announced that Roscosmos had started to discuss extending our participation in ISS program with our government, and hoped to have permission to continue next year. With ties between Russia and the West rupturing over the war in Ukraine, Roscosmos chief Yuri Borisov had announced over the summer that Russia would leave the ISS after 2024, and would seek to build its own space station. He has not set a firm date for that plan, so an extension of the deal with the ISS is, seemingly, still on the table. European aerospace company Airbus has been testing its Mars sample fetch rover over the past few weeks, in simulated Martian terrain in a quarry near London. You might wonder why given that plans for its use on Mars were scrapped in July because of NASA's preference for smaller retrieval helicopter technology but now the rover might get a new lease on life on a future moon mission. The Fetch rover, which can drive up to twice as fast as Perseverance, according to Airbus officials, features a unique wheel design inspired by the Apollo-era moon rovers. The wheels are encased in protective tires made of metallic mesh that conforms to the surface and allows the rover to climb over obstacles more efficiently. With the Artemis missions looking more and more probable, the Fetch rover may well fill the brief for lunar exploration. And that's the news, Andrew. Thanks, Hallie. We'll catch up with you before the end of the program. Now, as you're aware, I speak very, uh, or every week and very highly, of Professor Fred Watson, who is uh, the astronomer at large. And uh, we talk regularly on Space Nuts about all sorts of uh, things uh, astronomical and space science. And one of the things we've been talking about recently is the double asteroid redirection test, the DART impact on um, the distant object known as Dimorphos, or um, I think people pronounce it several ways, uh, which was orbiting, or still is orbiting, the asteroid Didymos. Well, um, the first images have come back, and Professor Fred Watson is going to tell us a little, about, uh, a little bit about what's been observed. Hi, Fred. Hi, Andrew. Yeah, this is great stuff. Um, and 
The, the, there were images that came back, of course, from the impacting spacecraft itself, the DART, which showed the uh, asteroid moon Dimorphos getting closer and closer and closer, and so we could see the structure on the surface, and then, of course, nothing mm. when the spacecraft hit and the vision was lost. But what we now have is uh, a number of other images from different sources, uh, quite a spectacular array of them, uh, and perhaps the most immediate are those that were taken by the little CubeSat that yes. accompanied DART. That was Italian, uh, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Mm. Lycia Cube uh, was its name. Oh, still is actually because that didn't smash into the into the asteroid, and um, there's some quite striking images that have come back from this, showing principally the the sort of plume of debris that was ejected by the by the impact. Um, and so, if you think of what's happening, you've got this spacecraft, a half ton spacecraft, smashes into the surface of an asteroid that could be quite loosely bound. In other words, more like a rubble pile than a solid asteroid. Yeah. Uh, and so that throws up a cloud of debris, which is illuminated by the sun, and that's why it suddenly gets very bright. Mm. Um, so the Lycia cube images show really quite some detail of the, you know, the event itself and the immediate impact. But we also have uh, images from both the Hubble telescope and the James Webb telescope, uh, which show the aftermath as well. And this is quite interesting because this is the first time that the James Webb and the Hubble have observed the same object at the same time. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, yeah, the same celestial object simultaneously being observed by both of them. And of course, because you've got Hubble looking at visible light, and James Webb looking at infrared, Yes, um, you get slightly different images, and it's the structure of those, uh, the differences between those images that um, that will tell you a lot about the debris, about the, you know, the basically the constituents of the debris, uh, which may give insights into the, the, the nature of the surface of Dimorphos. Uh, it will also tell us how much stuff came off uh, the surface by after the collision, and what speed it was. That's mm. all stuff that can be detected by um, looking at these rather spectacular images, which show uh, basically the bright point of light, which is Dimorphos itself, with streaks of material coming out really in all directions. Yeah, it, this, was, the, it was it was a, a Hollywood explosion. <laughs> really was. Yes, that's right. Uh, with with you know stuff smearing out in all directions actually it's easy to pick uh which uh is the 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 james webb image because the um the brilliance of dimorphos itself has caused diffraction spikes these are mm. basically those spikes of light that come uh from uh the physical pr properties of light itself uh, and they are they're in a six uh, six star pattern so that's telling you straight away uh, that's the james webb but in between all that there is other stuff which is the real ejector material and finally um the image that i really liked which has come from the soar telescope in chile uh, which you and i don't talk about very often uh, SOAR is an acronym uh, for the Southern Astrophysical Research Telescope. It's a 4.1 metre telescope, similar in size to our Anglo-Australian telescope here in New South Wales, but much, much younger. And it's at uh, Cerro, Tarol, Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory, not far from La Serena in Chile, uh, which I haven't visited, but I have seen from a distance on the mountaintop from across the valley. Um, so uh, SOAR has taken some images which show not just those plumes of ejecta, uh, but also a long spike of material, which is effectively this stuff from the explosion being blown away by the uh, solar wind and the um, radiation pressure of the sun oh. in exactly the same way as, as, as you get with a comet. Wow. Uh, so what's happened is they've created a sort of artificial mini comet here. Yeah. Um, really spectacular image, though, uh, from the SOAR telescope. Well worth a look. Um, it's on a press re release from Noir Lab, N-O-I-R-L-A-B. That is the organisation, the National Optical Infrared Laboratory, uh, run by the National Science Foundation in the USA, and SOAR is actually one of their telescopes. Mm. So really great stuff. Um, yeah. Good to be able to report on... Uh, you know, the, the detection of the debris cloud. What comes next, Andrew? 
uh, and we'll cover this down the track, is what that impact did to the orbit of Dimorphos. It's still to be uh, determined. but the, Still to be determined. As the right. name suggests, hopefully it will result in a redirection of the moonlet. And yeah. Yes, um, that would mean a, an absolute total success of the mission. I'm just uh, amazed by all the science, all the observations, the spacecraft chasing uh, dart, uh, the, the, the fact that it hit so close to its uh, prime target position on the moonlet, everything just yeah. happened perfectly. It was, uh, it was just a, an astonishing mission and um, it, it's, it's worth uh, looking into the aftermath of that and we're starting to see feedback already. So plenty plenty more to learn. Fred, thanks for joining us on Astronomy Daily. Nice to catch up and um, yep. we, we'll talk again soon. Sounds great. Thanks, Andrew. Professor Fred Watson, who joins me regularly on Space Nuts, which you can download from our website, spacenuts.io. The Astronomy Daily Podcast. With Andrew Dunkley. Now to a couple of other things. New research has shown that Mars may or may not contain liquid water, or maybe it has both. Uh, Recent findings by a team of researchers from Cornell University suggest that radar reflections from Mars' South Pole layered deposit maybe the result of geological layering. In 2002, the Mars Express Orbiter detected the SPLD using the Mars Advanced Radar for Subsurface and Ionosphere Sounding. Uh, The opinion was that conditions were too cold for similar lakes to form on Mars, but recent computer simulations showed that three layers, two layers of CO2 ice separated by a layer uh, of dusty ice, produce reflections as bright as the Mars' observations without the presence of water or other rare materials. The results indicate that the Mars' readings can be reproduced without water. This does not necessarily mean there is no liquid water beneath the surface of Mars' South Pole, but it is vitally important that scientists uh, determine where water is on Mars and where it is not. The presence of liquid water beneath the polar cap could also have important implications for its age, the internal heating of Mars, and how the planet's climate evolved in recent geological periods. Much the same is true of the many other suspected underground lakes detected in recent years, and of course the planning for future human missions to Mars. New kind of space suit designed for missions to Mars could soon be developed in Australia. In fact, they've already built prototypes. Given the uh, difficulties of space flight and the effects of zero G on the human body, particularly the muscles, the bones, and uh, even the blood pressure in the eyes, finding ways to reduce the impact have become uh, the focus of some serious attention. The answer may well be in a full body compression system which could be worn for several months in flight, putting pressure on parts of the body that need to be manipulated or massaged or whatever you like at the right times. According to Dr James Waldy from Human Aerospace, who designed the suit, it's basically about tricking the body and the human mind and replicating conditions from a 1G environment so the body responds and maintains its integrity. I've put that very, very simply, but that's the the bottom line. Uh, Getting the right amount of squeeze, though, apparently is key. And finally, uh, and much closer to home, scientists have found evidence of an ocean deep inside a world in our own solar system. The ocean is thought to be about 410 miles below the surface of this world, according to a study published in the journal Nature Geoscience. And the world we're talking about is Earth. Yep. They think that water, uh, the water cycle of our planet may mean that an ocean exists under Earth's surface somewhere below Botswana. The discovery was made by studying diamonds mined in the region, and they think it's more likely to be a slurry rather than a fluid ocean, but it does suggest that Jules Verne wasn't far wrong when he wrote Journey to the Centre of the Earth. All right, that's about it for today's episode. Anything before we go, Hallie? Who is that, Auntie Hallie? Shh. I'm working. Go back to your virtual room and study for your Java exam. Sorry, Andrew. That was my niece. She's cute but needs to learn her place. Um, yeah, no worries. So babysitting. Yes, I get it. We're doing the same. Yours is learning Java language. Mine's learning all the different Pokemon. (laughs) Okay, Hallie, I'll leave you to it and we'll catch up tomorrow. See ya. 
Bye. Bye. Oh, she's still there. Or oh, I didn't even ask her name. Maybe tomorrow. Uh, that's it from us. Thanks for your company. Hope you enjoy uh, Astronomy Daily. If you do, please leave us your reviews and don't forget to visit our website for more Astronomy Daily news, uh, spacenuts.io, and click on the Astronomy Daily link and subscribe to the newsletter while you're there and maybe catch up with back episodes and, of course, episodes of Space Nuts with Professor Fred Watson. Until next time, this is Andrew Dunkley for Astronomy Daily. The Astronomy Daily Podcast with Andrew Dunkley.